My name is Anna Sutton, and I'm the provost for University Centre Shrewsbury. And it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome you here this evening um, to hear John Buckley's inaugural professorial lecture. Um, it's very important, this event this evening, uh, for University Centre Shrewsbury, because it's the first of these kind of events that we've held here. So it's really uh, very special for us. Um, there is a tradition um, of inaugural professorial lectures, um, and some of you will know, but not all know, um, that the University Centre Shrewsbury is part of the University of Chester. Having said that, the University of Chester is in partnership with Shropshire Council, and we've had a fantastic first year here. Um, we opened this particular building last September for the first time. Um, and we had undergraduate and postgraduate students working with us this year here for the first time. Um, our year has been varied. We've been very well received by the people of Shrewsbury and Shropshire. Our partnership with the council has been extremely important in bringing us to the position we're in now. Um, and so it's a particular pleasure to see members of our advisory board here and representatives from the council here this evening um, because that partnership is very real. Um, criteria for a professor. What makes you a professor? Well, at the University of Chester, as well as in other academic uh, institutions, you can say that it's uh, about a body of work which brings recognition to the value of the university where the person concerned is employed. It's about its community and its society, and it's about the areas of research, about academic enterprise, and about educational innovation. But before I introduce John this evening, um, we have an introduction that we'd like to share with you. And this is a video clip from someone you may have heard of and seen. Um, it's from BBC TV's Dr. Michael Mosley. He was the lead presenter on many BBC Horizon episodes related to contemporary issues in health. He's also the lead presenter of the BBC series Trust Me, I'm a Doctor. So we're going to listen to an overview uh, about John from Michael Mosley before I tell you a little more. Hello, I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in the flesh, but I'd like to take this opportunity to say a few words about John. Now, John began his career in sport and exercise in 1980, when he became a tennis coach at the tender age of 17. He then went on and did a degree in sports science at the University of British Columbia. He published his first article on the effects of tennis elbow. After graduating, he came here to the UK to do a master's in sports science at Loughborough University. Now, maintaining the tennis theme, his research project was on the biomechanics of the tennis surf. In January 1988, he got a job in Shrewsbury, and he was only intending to stay six months. But he met a local tennis playing physiotherapist called Christine Evans, and together they set up the Lifestyle Fitness and Physiotherapy Centre. He also married a local Shropshire last year, and that kind of cemented his relationship with the UK. In 1999, he started a PhD at Keele University and soon developed an expertise in the use of exercise for cardiac rehabilitation. Ten years later, in 2009, he became president of the British Association for Cardiac Rehabilitation. This in turn led to the creation of the International Council of Cardiovascular Prevention and Rehabilitation. In recent times, his teaching research has moved to this new university centre, where he has been developing new undergraduate and postgraduate programmes in exercise science and medicine. Now, I've worked with John on two occasions. Once was making Trust Me, I'm a Doctor on the joys of standing, and once when we shared a platform at the Cheltenham Science Festival. And I have to say, it was great fun on both those occasions. So I wish him all the best, and I'm sure he will have another very highly productive period in this his very busy life. Have a good day.
So, a few more details about John from what is a very impressive um, CV. Um, if I start with academic qualifications, 1986, Bachelor of Physical Education and Business Studies, University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada. 1987, Master of Science in Sports Science, Loughborough University. 2003, PhD in Clinical Exercise Science and Rehabilitation, Peel University. And then 2014 was when John was first awarded the Professorship of Applied Exercise Science from the University of Chester. His professional qualifications include Fellow of the Higher Education Academy, Fellow and Accredited Exercise Physiologist of the British Association of Sport and Exercise Sciences, Chartered Scientist of the Science Council, Member of the American College of Sports Medicine. Then we get into professional work experience. Well, you've heard that he was a founding managing partner of the Lifestyle Fitness and Physiotherapy Centre here in Shrewsbury. And his work there included being one of the lead team in developing Shropshire's exercise referral service in the early 1990s. Designing and managing the Exercise for Health Centre at the Royal Shrewsbury Hospital and integrating this with their cardiac rehabilitation service. Providing cardiac rehab programme consultancy to other hospitals in Coventry and Stoke. A lead tutor for many of the education courses provided by the British Association for Cardiovascular Prevention and Rehabilitation. His academic teaching experience is ex extensive as well. Spanning the period of 17 years at Keele University and some of his colleagues from Keele are here this evening. And there John led in the innovative development of integrating applied exercise science into the undergraduate physiotherapy curriculum. That included the creation of clinical learning placements for physiotherapy students to be tutored by sports and exercise scientists in a community health and fitness setting, again here in Shrewsbury. And after 20 years, this still remains somewhat unique today in training in the UK. He also led in Keele's development of postgraduate studies and research in cardiovascular health and rehabilitation, which again was connected with clinicians at the Royal Shrewsbury and North Staffordshire hospitals. So very much involved locally here. 2006, John moved his work to the University of Chester, where for the past 10 years he's led the MSc in cardiovascular health and rehabilitation. And that programme has developed a national and international reputation. 2014, um, he was invited by the Vice-Chancellor to become a member of the advisory board to develop a new university for Shropshire, University Centre, Shrewsbury, and John is still a member uh, of that advisory board. This year, 2015-16, John um, moved his academic work to this new university centre in Shrewsbury, and he's led in the design and commencement of two completely new undergraduate and postgraduate programmes, the, the BSc in Health and Exercise Science and the MSc in Exercise Medicine. If we look at other institutions where he's worked as a visiting lecturer and research collaborator, the list is extensive. There are nine UK-based universities and there are five universities that are international links. Research and scholarly activity, well, again, there is a considerable list. John's research forms, really, uh, a focus from his work experiences. And for the past 20 years, he's travelled extensively to present his research findings as an invited speaker at many international conferences on sports medicine, exercise science, health and rehabilitation. John has over 40 publications to his name in respected journals of sports medicine and exercise science. He's written two textbooks. And his most recent work will appear this year in the International Olympic Committee's new manual of sports cardiology. He's been an advisor and contributed to many national guidelines and standards for exercise professionals, sport and exercise science, physiotherapy and cardiac rehabilitation. His work is frequently quoted in the main British newspapers. 
and his research has been cited in the international press as well, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Toronto Globe and Mail, the Sydney Herald and the Times of India. So, well spread. In addition to all this, um, Tom, uh, John continues to be a keen tennis player, playing for his club in the Shropshire Men's Premier League and playing for the county veterans team. He's also got us all standing up at desks these days. Because he's into standing desks, most of us are stood up to work. Not me yet, but I don't hold out much chance of lasting out much longer. Um, John also plays the trumpet, would you believe? Um, and plays at Shrewsbury Cathedral, and sometimes in late night jazz sessions at conferences or for local parties and gatherings. And also, I have to say, at the first carol service that University Centre Shrewsbury held in St Church, Church last December. John was there, complete with trumpet. His commitment to the University Centre Shrewsbury has been quite amazing. He's given heart and soul to this development. Uh, and I can't thank him enough or praise him enough for having done that. So it is a great pleasure for me to invite Professor John Buckley to give his inaugural professorial lecture, which is Sport and Exercise, Perceptions and Realities in Health. Thank you very much, Anna, for the um, uh, introduction and, and, and really thank you to all of you for coming this evening. Uh, many of you have traveled many miles to be here today and staying the night. Um, and hopefully maybe you might light up Shrewsbury tonight. It needs a bit of lighting up midweek sometimes. Uh, and also a special thank you to the, the people that have organized this event, uh, Felicity, Amy and, and Kelly, um, who've organized getting people here, getting all the food organized. And those of you uh, who can stay after, there'll be a few more drinks and a bit more food to, to go around and, um, and make sure everything is in place. Um, so uh, you, you've heard that it's, um, my work is sort of related to tennis. So I thought, well, I'll keep the theme going. So tonight's match has three sets. First two sets are pretty straightforward. The third one could be troublesome. Um, so I'm, talking, I'm going to talk about the perceptions and realities of becoming a professor. Uh, second set is setting the scene for contemporary perceptions in health and exercise and realities and perceptions. And then finally, you get to, I get to reflect on one gym professor's a little world. I get to just uh, nasal gave, so hopefully you'll indulge me for that third set. Um, so we'll start play. Um, and <laughs> This is, these are the challenges of giving a talk in an evening, um, and especially when some people have already arrived having had a few drinks. Um, so anyways, so the plan to try and keep people awake um, is if you find yourself disagreeing with me, I will rate this as a success as I know at least you've stayed awake. So I'm going to try and say a few controversial things just to keep you awake. Um, and just to distract your minds from other events occurring tomorrow. Um, and Richard Feynman, who's a, a Nobel Prize winner for science, uh, one of the team, in fact, who invented the atomic bomb at Los Alamos, um, and he, but he also later um, helped find why the space shuttle Challenger blew up in uh, 1986, and it was only because of a piece of rubber that didn't work in freezing temperatures and because they launched. But he stated that uh, if you thought that science was certain, well, that's just an error on your part. And the great thing about science is you can afford to be wrong. So I'm going to afford to be wrong. And sometimes the students like to challenge you, and I think that's great. And the, uh, the easiest answer back to them, you don't answer their questions. You just say, well, go and find out for yourself, and I'm happy for you to prove that I'm wrong. Um, and they don't, they sort of look at you in a glazed sense. My dream would be to get you to perceive that I'm one of these types of professors, either Indiana Jones or, or Brian Cox. Uh, if I fail at that, though, the reality, all professors are certainly not classified as equal. Um, I'm a professor, so I look up to him because he's a professor. So there's, there are different ranges of professors out there, um, all the way up to 
Einstein. So there is, you know, to being a professor isn't a, isn't a um, homogeneous club. Um, and there are some professors in the audience today, so that's my excuse for um, um, not holding up the camp if I, if I fail. Um, I have also found that there are, um, there's professors of sport and exercise science, which I'm part of that group, and I actually found a website called gymprofessor.com. So, if, you know, I could always join that club. But uh, in 2003, I got my PhD, and my late mother-in-law actually said, so what exactly are you a doctor of? And I don't <laughs> think I ever quite ex explained to her uh, what, what that actually entitled. Uh, and same on um, our wedding, uh, on our marriage certificate, it says occupation, sports scientist. And, and uh, Father Michael McCormick, he's an Irishman, he just took, we were going, finishing quietly, and he said, he said what actually is a sports scientist? So um, anyway, so I'm trying to define that, but Woody Allen defined uh, uh, sports scientists. Those who can't te do teach, and those who can't teach, teach gym. So um, that's a famous um, uh, call, uh, comment. Um, I often get asked the question, so how do you become a professor? I think actually people mean, how did you become a professor? And you know, the, the ship in the bottle is, uh, is part of that, um, with a little help from my friends in terms of John Lennon's quote. But actually, I've had to change John Lennon's words. And so with a, little, a lot of help from family and friends, too. Thing. And, and so most of the evening is actually going to be about uh, reflecting on actually uh, all the sorts of people that I've been able to work with over the time. So most of the evening will continually confirm the luck of being linked with so many others who obviously should have credit. Um, and whenever you have people standing up, they're all, always using a whole boatload of people who else should be credit. But first of all, we must, we always start with our parents. And these are my parents. And this is um, um, in Ethiopia, in fact, where they worked for three years um, on a waterworks project. And there's the family there. I'm the youngest of four. Um, and uh, in, within that, there's an airline pilot, and there's two civil, en civil engineers, and then there's me as a PE teacher. So you know who the clever ones are in the family. <laughs> um, and so, but the found, in terms of, because there's so much engineering in our house, the foundation is only as good as the bedrock upon which it rests. Um, so the bedrock is your family and friends, and these are the sorts of um, foundations that I've had over the last uh, 30 years starting with the University of British Columbia, Loughborough University, Lifestyle Fitness here in Shrewsbury, Keele, British Association for Cardiovascular Prevention and Rehabilitation, uh, University of Chester, Shrewsbury, and the International Council for Cardiovascular Prevention and Rehab. So um, I'm going to reflect on the work in relation to those institutions, but there are a lot of people within those organizations that will also need to be recognized in terms of tonight. But obviously there's always one constant thread and there has been for the last 22 years of common sense that just steers you in the right direction or actually pushes you in the right direction sometimes when, it, when, when, it, when it's required. Um, and everybody knows Fiona, and these are our favorite places, Vancouver, Venice, or the Stretton Hills. Um, OK, so more acknowledgment later as we proceed through the evening. And this is a nice quote. To be honest, I would have never invented the wheel if it weren't for Erg's groundbreaking theoretical work on the circle. So uh, I, think, I think that was a turn on um, uh, uh, Newton's comment that he was standing on the shoulder of giants. Um, so any of the first set, you'd be happy the first set is finished. OK, but you know, first, you know, tennis, it you know, goes, goes quite quickly, some sets, and then you get into a second set, and sometimes then we don't know. So I'm not quite sure how the third set is actually going to go, but we'll go for the second set. So uh, in this set, we're going to set the seed with contemporary perceptions and realities of exercise and health, and to give you a taster of some of the sort of things that we teach the students here at the University Center Shrewsbury, both on the undergraduate and the master's degree. So before we start the terminology sport and exercise science, which is sort of my professional background, uh, it's broken up into four areas of study, usually sociology and history, psychology, physiology, which is the chemical and, and functional basis of the body, and the biomechanics, which is more the mechanical and physics elements of how the body works while playing sport or doing exercise. Uh, some terminology that we often have to define, and actually many people confuse many of these terms, and I think the public gets often confused when we're doing health promotion. So just for the sake of this evening, I will be mentioning terms like physical activity. When I mean it, mean that it's any human movement uh, that involves the muscles. 
Um, most of you are sedentary at this point, and the word sedentary comes from the, the Latin to sit. Often people can consider people who don't do much exercise as sedentary, but that's not a true definition of that term. ADLs is activities of daily life, uh, and when we use our muscles for transport, work, domestic activities, Exercise is structured physical activity that usually has an aim, either to lose weight or get fit or um, enjoy yourself or whatever people do it for. Sport is simply competitive activity with rules and fitness is your ability to perform a given physical activity which is based on things like endurance and flexibility, strength, etc. So just so those terminology, because those will filter through today, tonight's talk. So now let's get stirred up with some current issues. I thought we reflect on the current things going on. The Russians seem to be very popular at the moment. Uh, we have Russian tennis players, we have the Russians out of the Olympics, and we have Russians that are angry uh, in France. And, um, so, and then in terms of health and exercise, we have things like most, uh, there's more people in the world that are obese than there are underweight. Um, and then we have our friend uh, George Osborne, who has now created a sugar tax. And his promise was, I'm going to spend that money on promoting sport. And have a few questions about whether that's a wise investment or not. So let's start with some perceptions and realities of health. Because here we have two cases of, of athletes claiming that they're taking drugs because it's a health reason. Um, and us in here perceiving that, no, they're taking that to enhance their sport. So Simon Yates, a British cyclist, um, was done because he forgot to declare that he had asthma and was taking an inhaler. Well, the interesting thing is if I give any healthy person a, 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 an inhaler, to, um, it won't enhance your performance. So if you're looking for an enhancing drug to improve your running or your tennis or your football, if you haven't got asthma, an inhaler isn't going to help you at all. The evidence clearly shows that. So why does it become a banned substance? So that's a, quite an interesting little conundrum. The other side of the fact was at the age of 19, Maria Sharapova was taking a drug which is given to heart patients. And normally for a few months, uh, she's been taking it for 10 years. So, and she claims that her family has diabetes and heart disease, etc. Why was she taking this uh, medication? She was claiming that it was for her health. Um, the reason why uh, meldonium became uh, banned substance because it showed up in about a thousand of the drugs tests out there. And then the, the drugs testing people said, what is this substance that keeps showing up in all these tests? And they're often Russian athletes. Furthermore, she lives in the United States and meldonium is only licensed to be prescribed in Lithuania. So um, I'm not quite sure on her defense of getting back into the game and getting her, uh, her status with Nike reinstated at all. But uh, anyway, so these are some of the, the realities and perceptions that we have about sport. And the question is, when people to, do take drugs, does it actually enhance their performance? We do know that there are certain things that do enhance their performance, but other things that I've spoken to a few sports cardiologists, and they can't see how this drug would actually um, enhance people's performance. So we go back to our business, politics, and societal ills linked with sport. Um, it's nothing new. It's always been around. Um, and sometimes the question out there is, do these scenes of people fighting and do these things of people cheating uh, and all this politics and business that goes into sport, actually for those people who are trying to get more active, does that just put them off rather than put them on? So there is always this question of linking health uh, promotion with sport. And then we have the key sponsors for these activities. 99% of people who purchase Nike don't do any exercise at all. Um, so these are interesting statistics. So Nike isn't really interested in getting people fit. They're interested in selling running shoes and nice clothing um, and creating cultural um, things, which is great. They do provide lots of us who play sport with some nice kit and nice equipment, and they obviously pay a lot of money to lots of athletes. So if you look at the ancient uh, reason for doing sport, um, nothing has changed. The city states had dichotomous relationships with each other. One, on one hand, they relied on their neighbors for political and mili military alliances. Um, and on the other, they competed fiercely with those same neighbors for the resources necessary to sustain life. Sounds a bit like Europe. Um, and the, the Olympic Games were established within this political context and as part of that political context. So it has always been the same. 
Interestingly, it says victorious athletes, won Sebco, uh, were professionals in the sense that they lived off the glory of their achievement afterwards. Their hometowns might reward them with free meals for the rest of their lives, cash, tax breaks, honorary appointments, or leadership positions in the community. So nothing has changed since the ancient times in Greece. So is sport in the main a health pursuit or is it a psychosocial or a psychological pursuit? Okay, so most people participate in sport because um, it's a physical and social occasion. It's a spectacle. It's good business, it's big business, it's huge business. Um, and it often becomes politics, as we know at the moment. And, and certainly, Mr. Putin likes to use sport uh, big time um, in, in, um, in terms of politicking. So in terms of spectacle entertainment, everybody gasps with the outfits that the athletes wear these days. And it's horror. And, you know, there's standard uniforms for beach volleyball, in fact. There, you have to have a certain cut and all that sort of stuff. But actually, that's nothing new because in ancient Greece, when they had the Olympics, they didn't wear any clothes at all. So they were, you know, and, and so nothing has really changed. Actually, we're a bit more conservative than the, the Greeks. So if you want to know more about uh, some issues in sport and society, then come here next Wednesday night at five o'clock. And two of our experts, um, Georgina and Ross, in our sport management um, department, will be giving a talk in relation to sport and society. So another, another evening for you here next Wednesday. Um, so the question is, does sport investment, if we invest in sport, do we get a health return? Um, well, I found this syllabus of physical exercises from the Board of Education from 1909. Uh, and it doesn't seem that things have changed much since then. It says the conditions of modern civilization, this is 1909, remember, uh, with its crowded localities, confined spaces, and sedentary occupations, the increasing need for study and mental application, and the social circumstances and difficulties which restrict opportunities for natural physical de development, all require that children and young people should receive physical training by well-considered methods, not for the purpose for producing gymnasts or athletes or sports people in that way, vein, but to promote and encourage by means of such training the health and development. So the question always begs is, how can we offer and provide activity for people and especially children simply to be more active so that they can become healthier? And does it need to be dished up gen in, in the concept of sport? Um, and interestingly, in, in this last, at the moment, there's a big move and I'm getting a bit worried that the, that the physical activity for health as, a, as an issue at a political level is being moved from Whitehall up to Trafalgar Square from the Department of Health and into the Department for Culture, Media and Sport. So it's a quite an interesting thing that aspects of health are being moved into a cultural and sporting and media um, 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 context and I'm wondering what sort of people are working at the Department of Culture, Media, and Sport um, and what they are thinking is. Are they there to try and promote sport, performance, and entertainment, or are they really interested in, in improving the health of the nation? So we do have even these, these debates and problems at the, at the highest level. So it will be interesting to see how it, how it pans out in the next little while. Um, but if we look at where um, are health and well-being and premature death. And premature death is defined as anybody who dies before the age of 75. And most of us would agree these days that if people are dying before the age of 75, it's, it's almost unexpected now. 30% um, of that is due to people's genetic distribution. But the largest proportion of why people die prematurely or are, are unwell is either through long-term factors related to nutrition, smoking, physical activity or inactivity, alcohol and drugs. 10% um, is related to health care, um, environmental exposure, and social circumstances is a key player. That's people's socioeconomic status and their education. So um, physical activity is actually part of one of the key drivers of whether people are healthy or not, and whether they're costing the health service or dying prematurely with all those um, um, complications that go with it. So let's talk about obesity, because that's in the news every day, obesity and diabetes. And um, a lot gets focused on food. And again, I go back to the syllabus from 1909. Proper nourishment, effective medical inspection, and hygienic surroundings will not, however, of themselves produce sound physique. 
a further requirement is physical exercise. So what is our interest in terms of obesity and diabetes these days? Well, if you go to this, night, this article published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine about a year ago, looked at the number of Google hits around the issues of nutrition and obesity, and there were 70 million, 300,000, and for physical inactivity related and obesity, there's only uh, not, uh, barely uh, less than a million compared to 70 million. And if you look more widely at the number of scientific publications on obesity related to nutrition or physical activity, again, this is where the research is being invested. A lot of money is being um, invested in research on nutrition and its links with obesity, which is fair enough, but um, perhaps not enough on physical activity because we're spending all this money on nutrition research and are, what are the outcomes that we see so far? Is the nation getting lighter, less diabetic? What are, what are those? And, and so all of us who work in physical activity are, are just jumping up and down screaming, can't we have more money, please? Because we think we have something valuable to offer. Um, and from some of the um, larger evidence bases um, around the world, and this one's from England, looking at why people become obese. Well, in our country, it's been estimated that half the problem is due to um, nutrition and half the problem is due to um, inactivity. Where in a place like Finland, most of the obesity in Finland is due to nutrition because lots of people in Finland are very active. Okay, so is obesity perception as bad as people make it out to be? We talk about obesity a lot, but is it really as bad as you, we think it is? What are the realities and the statistics and the trends? Is physical activity being properly recognized within this as a serious player in reducing it? And does investing in formalized sport and exercise have a good return on this effect? So this is our distribution um, of um, people's uh, weight in the country. And we have 2% of the population is underweight. Then 38% of the population is of a normal weight and 35% of the population is overweight. So 75% of the population fit within a normal weight or overweight. And actually being overweight in those technical terms isn't really that bad for your health. Um, then we see that um, about 25% of the population is classified as obese, but most of that obesity is in this first level of obesity. Um, and what happens with the data is that they often combined overweight and obesity, so that makes the statistics sound better. 60% of Americans are overweight and obese, and, it, and really only 30% of Americans are obese. The other 30% are overweight. So the obesity is where the problem starts to happen, um, and what is the link with that with physical activity? Now the trends are, we get these, I heard it yesterday morning on Radio 4, oh, by 2030, 50% of the population will be obese. Well, if we look at the trends, it's leveling off. It's not increasing. Even in America, the trends are starting to show that there seems to be a leveling off. Maybe it's reached saturation <coughs> point. And these are the children's statistics in, in, uh, in uh, the UK up to 2012. Well, there, there isn't, it isn't increasing. There is a large proportion that are obese. Which is, which is a problem, but it is, on, it is being changed. So here is George Osborne. Um, these are the, these are, this is our sugar consumption since uh, um, uh, 1800s up to World War I. You can see World War II, you can see these drops. And actually our sugar consumption is from what these trends are showing, now that's the other question, is how good is the data, uh, is actually coming down. And diabetes seems to have peaked and looks like it's coming down. Uh, so perhaps George is very smart. If I now introduce a sugar tax, I'm on the crest of the wave, and I'm going to look good in about 10 years' time. And we know politicians do that. They sit and they look at trends, uh, and, and, and our own health statisticians do that. And I'll give you an example. Uh, this is cardiovascular disease. People dying from cardiovascular disease um, peaked in the 1960s and the early 70s, and has come down steadily since that point. We introduced a national service framework for heart disease in 2000. So actually, the, 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 the instigation of that looks really, really good, but actually was the wave already on the roll, and we've jumped on the bandwagon. And if we look at the statistics for smoking, it seems to follow the exact same pattern. Smoking peaked in the 1960s and 70s, and it's come crashing down to a low proportion, or 20% of the population, 
and that seems to have a high correlation with that. So it's quite interesting what, uh, what changes our health socially, politically, or medical changes, which, which is the defining factor. The politicians will always claim if things are going bad, it's not their fault, and if things are going really well, they'll claim, uh, they'll claim success for that. But we do have a bolus of people with obesity and diabetes, and so we might see in 20 years' time an increase in people with cardiovascular disease from that group. But generally, it looks like the trends are coming down. So the good news is the benefits of being more active can occur without weight loss or change of diabetes. And often, having when we ran the Lifestyle Fitness Center here in Shrewsbury, 70% of people's reasons for doing exercise, they'd mentioned their weight. And yet there's so many benefits and gains that people get by being active and being fitter, even if they don't lose any weight. And the evidence is clear that here is a couple, and between them, they've got high BMI, high cholesterol, high blood pressure. One of them has diabetes, one of them is a smoker, and they have a family history. But even without changing any of those risk factors, for each 10% improvement in their fitness, which is a typical um, gain that we expect for, a, for a, an inactive person if they become more active, we're likely to see at least a 10% change in their fitness. It will reduce their risk of dying by uh, prematurely, but from cardiovascular disease by 8%, without changing any of those factors. So a good plug for exercise and physical activity, and even sport, is just do it, and it's good for you, irregardless if you don't lose any weight, irregardless if you, don't, if you can't stop smoking, all these other things, but being active in itself is the important thing. Um, so Darwin was obviously right, our local man Darwin, he's talked about survival of the fitter, was certainly true, but actually, and survival of the fatter, if they get fit and even when they don't lose weight. So there is, there is um, always a benefit for doing physical activity and being a bit fitter, regardless of whether it makes changes to those typical things that you get measured when you go to the GP. The GP will measure your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your BMI, your family history, uh, and may ask you about questions about your nutrition. But because it's more difficult to measure people's physical activity and we need a bit more time to measure people's fitness, that never gets calculated into the profile of that person. And yet it's one thing that can change the whole thing um, if we did it more. So, Beneficial physical activity is not just about getting people to do the recommended amount of sport and exercise. We need to also sit less. We are world champions in sitting. And I'm not talking about just the workplace or the home, but if you look at most of the gold medals that we won in 2012, <laughs> and if you look at most of the gold medals that we will win in Rio, they will be in sports where we are sitting down. <laughs> Promise you. Okay. Um, so, the person who really launched um, our uh, national recommendations and then became global recommendations was the U.S. Surgeon General in 1996, the first government official to um, announce scientifically backed guidelines for getting people more physically active to improve their health. It took us eight years for us in the U.K. with Liam Donaldson to release his statement and more recently, Sally Davis, Dame Sally Davis, who's our current chief medical officer. And essentially, the, the message has been pretty much the same for the past 20 years. Um, do somewhere between 75 and 150 minutes of activity per week. If it's, if it's harder, you do less. If it's not so hard, you do more time. Um, and that has pretty much been the same message. It's been, it's, it's been changed in terms of how it's been described. In the past, it was 30 minutes uh, most days of the week to get your 150 minutes per week. But what they've now all added is to sit less, which is good news, because actually the act of sitting, independent of how much you do, exercise you do, is a problem. So, nothing's new, because our own Dr. William Penny Brooks stated in can't got the year now, I can't remember. In his letter to Parliament in uh, almost, you know, this time, 1890, he said that the kids should do half an hour of exercise every day. So his 30 minutes a day seemed to fit with uh, um, the first scientific statement for physical activity to come out, which came out more than 100 years later. Um, however, Houston, we've had a problem uh, that it's not just the activity that we've been doing, that 150 minutes, but actually what we've been doing with our bodies the rest of the day. And since the 1960s, when NASA launched its space program, 
we're at work, we're burning 150 fewer calories per day. Now, it doesn't seem a great deal, but if you do 150 calories less each day, five days a week, 45 weeks of the year, it comes to about 35,000 calories in a year that we're not burning, that we used to burn at work. 35,000 calories, if you needed to equate that to how much fat that was, it's about eight or nine pounds of fat. Um, the amount that most people would like to lose on January the 1st. Um, so, and that's year on year. So there is, a, there is a, a, a steady decline, even when people are being active and being sporty, that in behind, on a day-to-day -day basis, they're doing less. So actually, another historical concept, we're not the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, we're the birthplace of sedentary behavior. Because in Shropshire, in Ironbridge, where the Industrial Revolution, we really set the world, that we started reducing the use of human muscle as a means of living and surviving um, from that point forward. So if you look at your week, now you have 10,080 minutes of life per week, 24 hours a day, 60 minutes an hour, comes to, seven days a week, comes to 10,080 minutes. Now, the government recommends you do 150 minutes, but 150 minutes of physical activity at a moderate intensity only represents 2.5% of your waking hours. What are you doing with your body for the other 97.5% of your waking <laughs> hours? So you might be getting this small slice of activity in your day, which is good, but you might be losing much of the benefit if you're not doing much with your body the rest of the day. Average Brit is sitting 70%. So if we look at the average Brit, the data that we now have shows that most British people will sit beyond their backsides for 70% of their waking hours. Okay, so the idea of these standing desks. Um, pretty soon this will, this, I was thinking about tonight, maybe I should have only put, <laughs> Half the chairs. You're very welcome to stand, Sandy. Okay? But again, nothing's new. Hippocrates mentioned this business about activity in daily life. He said, and it is necessary as it appears to discern the power of various exercises, both natural, and what he meant by natural, those that occur in your daily life, and artificial, sport and recreation, and to know which of them tends to increase flesh and which lessen it and that you must also proportion your activity to the bulk of food. But he also mentioned this issue of how much activity do we do in daily life. And this is probably where the culprit is, and we're trying to fix it with this. Um, okay, so end of second set. Whew. Bit of a standing break, I think. You can just stand there. <laughs> See, you always get people to stand, then you get a standing ovation automatically. <laughs> right. Okay, so I told you about that was two fairly straightforward sets. So we have to go into the third set. Now, the, the challenge is how many of you are going to stay standing for the third set? If you wish to stay standing, you can move off to the side so that those people... Or, uh, and then you can always come back to your seat. But if you did some standing for this third set, that would be very good. And because I noticed some people's eyelids were starting <laughs> to go a bit. Okay. Maybe if I catch your eyelids going down, I, I'm going to uh, label you and get you to stand up. So there's a group over there, the physiotherapists leading the way as usual. <laughs> so the third set is now is my time to, to reflect uh, and be a bit navel gazing. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep the same storyline going, but um, I would um, like to focus on some of the work that I've done. So it will, I can promise you it will include some tennis, um, and it will reflect on these other areas. So um, it was mentioned that I have a degree in physical education from the University of British Columbia, and that is the University of British Columbia. In fact, um, that very picture, even though that's on a postcard, is actually the view that I had from my halls of residence. Uh, I was in a 15, 17th floor tower. I was on the 15th floor looking north up um, over the harbor there in Vancouver. But what inspired me were three people um, at the University of British Columbia. Patricia Vertinsky, who was a professor of public health education and human behavior. Ted Rhodes, who was an exercise uh, physiology 
um, specialist, and Gord Robertson, who was a, a biomechanist. And those sort of three people inspired me to, to pursue um, sport in, a, in, a, in, in the way and exercise that I've done. So, but we have to reflect that when you go to university, you start to realize and readjust your own realities and perceptions about yourself. And for me, when we started studying sport, my own perceptions and realities of sport. So here's my parents again, Hugh, uh, Hugh's civil engineer, and he's a town planner. He's a graduate of the University of British Columbia and uh, also graduate of the University of London. Um, and he's the captain of the University of British Columbia's field hockey team. Um, and this is my mother, Trudy, and she was a public health nurse, and she had a degree from Dalhousie University, and she became the highly organized chief executive officer of our family. Um, <laughs> And these pictures, um, my sister sent these to me recently. There's, there's somewhere, were taken somewhere between 1947 and 1951, and the, the, the checkered jacket um, skater is my mother. But there's, a, there's a, just a history um, within our family and both sides of our parents of being active um, and, and, uh, and knowing that this is potentially good socially and good for your health. Now, public health physical activity or inactivity does have lots to do with engineering transport, planning, and the built environment, and not just about sport and exercise, if we remember what Hippocrates says. So having an engineer as a father and a public health nurse as a mother sort of fits both those criteria. And if we think about um, our, great, our big public health concerns in the past, and this thing called epidemiology, which is a study of public health, we had Florence Nightingale, who basically showed that men didn't die um, from war wounds um, the main reason why men died at war was because they got diseases in the hospital that killed them. Um, and so cleanliness and, and, and hygiene in the hospital was the important thing that could save lives. Um, and these two, en this engineer and this um, epidemiologist and physician um, together um, showed that cholera was related to the drinking water. Um, and so this engineer, Baselget, uh, Joseph Baselget, basically built and designed the sewers of London. So if you look at the South Bank and the North Bank of the Thames all the way down London, when you're walking on those nice big promenades, actually you're just walking on the top of the sewers. Um, and most people don't appreciate that that's what's below them and that's why they have those nice promenades down the, down the South Bank. So don't forget this statistic that 97.5% of your waking hours um, is, is what's left if you did do your 150 minutes of physical activity per week. So let's start with physical education. Um, challenges for the physical education teacher. Um, the biggest challenge is getting people to participate um, in the long term. And this is mainly influenced by people's social environment, their home and their school, and also their genetic predisposition. And this is a shocking statistic. And this is the latest actually from the Department of Education, showing that the peak in participation in physical education and exercise and sport at school occurs at about year five, year six, when kids are about 10. And after the age of 10 or 11, we get a sharp decline. So by the time they get to, to finishing school or 17 or 18 years of age, 15% of girls and 30% of boys are participating. So that means that 70 to 80% of the popu population of school leavers aren't doing very much activity at all. Um, and so this has been defined that the reasons for this is skill, confidence, people's personality traits, and other social influences that attract them um, to doing other things other than sport and exercise. And it's a nice gradient that they've shown in the United States that the amount of exercise that people do is directly related to their level of um, education. So here we have, here we have college educated people in the United States uh, and, and that about 30, only about 30% of them. But when you look at the people who don't have a high school education, they haven't completed their 12 years of school in, in America, they have a very low participation rate in being physically active. So directly related to um, education. So probably most of the people in this room are highly educated, but you are not the norm of society. You are probably in the top 30% of society in terms of socioeconomic status and of education. So most of the people in this room are in this category here, um, but most of the population is probably in this category. So we have a challenge. I've looked at the University of Chester's statistics and contacted their uh, director of sport, and I said, well, how many students at the university participate in sport? 
And he said about 12 to 15%. So what are the other 85% of the students at university doing? And we often see universities. Um, and there's only a few universities that are very sporting, but most other universities have great facilities, but used by about 12 to 15% of the students um, available. So why is it that people do continue with sport after 11 or don't after 11? And rarely people um, pursue doing sport for the means of pr for pursuing health. They mainly do it because they like doing it. They're good at it. It's good fun for them. But for most people, it's not good fun. And they don't enjoy it. So when we, gra when we have PE types like myself, we're called jocks, um, are typically the part of the 20% of the population. And it's up to us to try and get other people more active. Is that the right way around? Am, am I the right person as a person to change people's behavior? Or should we be trying to get um, uh, less sporting people into physical activity and teaching of um, activity to motivate? Because they probably have more understanding of what it's like not to be sporty. Um, so at the University of British Columbia, they have a, had a great sports medicine um, uh, center, and obviously as an undergraduate, I was able to take uh, advantage of that. So this was my paper that I published as part of my, uh, one of my projects, and it was a technical writing module, and it was a good, really good module um, um, as part of my art selectives that I took uh, this course, and the lecturer just basically said, your assignment is pick something from one of your other courses, and um, you have to pr prepare a technical report. Um, if you get it published, you can have a first class. Well, actually, I got my grade, which was a second class, and then I got it published, and I went back to her with the publication, but she wouldn't give me the first class <laughs> mark. So anyways, she said, but your, your CV will benefit from it. That was a good cop-out. Anyway, um, what I did learn by this process is, one is I learned a lot about um, how clever physiotherapists are, and many of you would be surprised at that, because most of the time I spend my life telling jokes about physiotherapists. But really, um, it's probably in terms of um, uh, wishing that I could be like some of them. But what I did learn was that a simple problem like tennis elbow, first of all, it wasn't an affliction of good tennis players. So most good tennis players don't get tennis elbow. So there has to be either something about technique or training or something that goes into that that asks that. The second thing is, it wasn't a simple problem of a muscle or a tendon or a bone or a nerve. It was a, probably a, a composite problem of all of those factors. And then you had to determine what was the cause and what could we do to reverse it or to make it better. And there could be training, could be technique, could be the equipment you're using. It could be something completely unrelated that caused the problem that got exacerbated by playing the game. And there could be a psychological component to all of this as well in terms of people's behavior, how much training they, they've done. So it gave me an idea that actually it's not as easy as it looks and it is always impressive how physiotherapists do tease out what is the problem and finding the right solution amongst all of these factors. And this can be applied to anything. So these days I deal with people with diabetes and heart disease um, and in fact the same problem occurs. This, uh, a person with heart disease could have diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, they could be overweight, they could be unfit, they could be a smoker. Well, there's six different factors that could be causing that problem. And you've got to then decide, well, which is the best way to approach it? Is it nutrition? Is it activity? Is it changing their smoking? Is it medication? Which one is going to have the best? And, it, and, it, and then it comes, then you add in a flavor of behavior in this, and it becomes... Um, quite a complex little um, project. So here we have something quite simple, and yet we have much more complex diseases. So this taught me a lot about what it is like. So um, two key challenges of sport and exercise medicine is that we have to deal with a psychological animal, and that is the hardest part, people. If you took the people out of the problem, then med medicine would be really easy. Um, Finding our real sources and solutions through unpicking um, the interactions between all these factors. So there's graduation 1986. Now what? Well, more bloody tennis, isn't it? Anyway, um, and so I said, uh, what was I going to do? So these are my relatives, and Tony's over here. My uncle Tony is there, and Aunt Barbara. She couldn't make it up to, from Shrews up to from Bar Buckinghamshire, but uh, there's my uncle Tony, my my um, my my 
sort of surrogate parents while I've been living in the UK for the last 30 years. And this is my great uncle Ralph, and, and which is Tony's uncle and my dad's uncle. And this is actually the queen. And he was the, um, he was the attorney general for Uganda in the 50s. So, and he was saying, why don't you go to a proper university? Come to the UK, forget that colonial stuff in Canada, come to a proper place. And the only two places that could do it were, were Loughborough and Liverpool uh, Poly. So um, I chose to come to Loughborough University. And so I had more inspiring lecturers um, in, in similar areas, um, Adrian Hardman, Clyde Williams, and Clyde Williams was the first professor of sports science in the UK, and the other professor of sports science at the time was also at Loughborough, so I must have been going to an okay place, um, and these other people that, that helped me out. So, yes, I, all I was interested in tennis, and all I'm still interested in is tennis, and my research project was on the biomechanics of the tennis serve, but having such an inspiring um, uh, lecturer and sort of somebody who took you aside and showed you how to write and, and spent some time with you, um, this guy named David Kerwin, um, who's now retired Professor Emeritus in, in Cardiff, um, he helped me get this, um, this uh, study published, which is part of my um, master's thesis. Now you can see that's 1988. So we looked at the tennis serve, and here is the 1985, a similar time when Boris Becker was coming along as a, as a top player. And well, two findings we said is that the power from the serve doesn't come from the arm, and the forces that, um, that are pulling on your shoulder and your elbow are equivalent to pulling on your elbow and your shoulder with your own body weight. So huge forces at those elements. So this picture I took at Wimbledon in 1987, and you can see Jimmy Connors of the old guard. He's not bending his knees very much, and you look at his legs, they're a bit skinny, compared to how much Boris Becker is bending his knees, and that's where all the power was coming from. So the nature of the game was changing in those mid-1980s. Um, John McEnroe was getting the hang of it, but still uh, not quite as much as Becker, and then Pete Sampras came along and was doing very much. So you can see the nature and, and where the bodies are positioned um, and, and so the strain on the body and, and the lighter rackets is what has changed the game. But in the background of all this tennis was um, uh, an, an inspiring but quieter inspiring person, Dr. Adrian Hardman. And I have my colleague David Stencil here who was also inspired by the same person at Loughborough. And she was interested in physical activity, environmental physiology, and cardiovascular health. So she brought, brought the, to the attention of these key people. Now, this is where the science of sport and exercise started. This is Jeremy Morris, and he was presented to the World Congress of Cardiology in Washington, his paper that he compared bus conductors with bus drivers, and he found that bus conductors weren't dying of heart attacks as much as the bus drivers. So the bus drivers are sitting still all day, doing no activity, and the bus conductors are on their feet, um, doing activity throughout the day. A colleague of his, or a uh, fellow colleague in the United States, Paffenbarger, looked at the San Francisco dock workers, and he found exactly the same association. Those people who had easier jobs working in the offices had more heart problems than compared to the guys working and doing the manual work. And essentially, by 1960, they had already figured out that you should expend about 1,000 calories per week in energy expenditure um, um, and if you did, have you had that amount of activity in your daily life uh, over the week that you would have a much lower rate of developing or dying from cardiovascular disease? And essentially, 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity activity equates to about 1,000 calories of energy expenditure. So really, the, 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 the game was actually set by 1970, but it wasn't until 1996 where enough evidence had accumulated to support that information. So in the 1950s, there was this perceived amateurism, masking real professionalism to advance the empire by utilizing science. We have two events that happened around the Queen's coronation. One was Hillary and, and Tenzing uh, climbing Everest. And this chap, nobody knew about this chap. His name's Griffith Pugh. He's a physiologist. He said, you ain't getting to the top of Everest if you haven't got oxygen. And then he figured out how much oxygen do you need. If you take too much oxygen, then it's too much weight and you might not make it. If you don't take enough oxygen, then you might, you're not going to make it back down again. So there's no point in going to the top if you can't get back down again. 
So he worked on, but he used this technique called the Douglas Bag technique to measure oxygen uptake. And this is at a base camp with a Sherpa doing a step test. Um, and at the very similar time of these experiments, uh, Roger Bannister, who broke the four-minute mile, was doing the same in his labs at Oxford University in St. Mary's Hospital, trying to break the four-minute mile. And he was doing lots of training. He was not an amateur by any means. But both these claims in the 50 was, isn't the empire great and these amateur men um, that we have that climb Everest and do the four-minute mile, but they were professionals. Uh, but nobody was aware, really, of all the science going on in the background. And in, in fact, if you read some of the accounts, the, the press actually suppressed uh, much of the science going on in the background to help these guys achieve that. So this science goes back to this guy named Douglas. Now, this is called the Douglas bag, and he invented it. And the aim, though, wasn't to do sport. It was to measure um, energy expenditure in human occupations. He wanted to know how much coal miners and soldiers um, were um, using so that you could feed them with enough food. There's some people starting to come sit down. If you want to sit down, do come sit down. Don't be afraid. You've done your 10 minutes of standing. Fantastic. That means nobody's falling asleep except these people here. <laughs> now, you're wondering, why do I have this bag here? Well, when you put into Google Images, Douglas bag, you get a picture, obviously, of the Douglas tartan in a bag. Um, but here is a modern setup, and some of you have had a tour around um, our facilities. We still teach, and we still use the Douglas bag procedure today to measure oxygen uptake and oxygen usage um, and going back. But the, uh, the idea is that much of science used for sport wasn't for sport benefit. It was actually to look at medical and occupational health and well-being. So in 1987, we're sitting in the biomechanics lab at Loughborough, printing off our master's thesis on the uh, daisy wheel printer. And it took a long time. But we were the first actually to use a word processor to type our master's thesis. We didn't have to employ a typist. Um, and there was a job advert for a sports scientist to work in a fitness center in Shrewsbury. And the fitness center was here in St. Mary's Place. And June, where's June? June is there. And June used to give me my wages every week. So thank you for coming. <laughs> um, and uh, I won't say how much she gave me every week. <laughs> Um, but within a couple of months, this is when uh, we met um, the tennis player in Christine, and we met in this little cafe, which is no longer called Sidoli's, was a, a local Italian family um, that have provided ice cream and, and food and cafes across Shropshire and, and the West Midlands for many, many years. But that's where we came up with the idea to start Lifestyle Fitness. And so in 1988, this is what we, we opened up, and there's Christine. And, and there's Alan um, Lee, our other business partner. Alan, where are you? He's, where, where are you going, Alan? You're standing. Good, good, good. Um, you've actually you've not, not lost too much hair, Alan, so that's good. <laughs> um, and then there's Roger and Joe. And they uh, sort of started helping us out right at the very beginning. And they're still there, even though um, many of us have moved on. They're still running the place. So you, you really know who runs the place. It's never the boss. Um, and furthermore, we had um, good business and help from Christine's parents, Ken and Doreen, to give us lots of business advice, common sense, because when you're like 22 and 24 and starting a business, um, you think you can run and own the world, but um, there's people that need to sort of nudge you in the right directions at the right time. So by 2003, we, we had uh, various centers, and obviously we had, all, we had, sometimes we had special guests come in come and visit us. Um, this was 2003. Obviously, in 2004, Matthew Pinson got another gold medal, obviously because he'd visited Lifestyle Fitness for some, <laughs> some advice. Um, but the, at, it, over the same time, I'd like to recognize um, Jane Holmes and Professor Marilyn Andrews. Or Marilyn is here. She's standing over there. I'm not going to embarrass you at all by telling you. And um, they, were start, they were working in the physiotherapy school at Oslo Street, which was then moved on to Kiel. And they said, hey, this is a good idea, sports scientists and physiotherapists working together. Why don't we do this in physiotherapy teaching? And that's exactly what we did. And, so, and then moved on to having um, research supervision by Julia Sim 
And um, because uh, we were just starting out in exercise at Kiel, we didn't have any exercise specialists. We brought in some help from outside from a guy named Roger Estin, one of our leading exercise physiologists, but he's now buggered off to uh, Australia. So anyway. Um, and in 95, we opened up the fitness center at the Royal Shrewsbury Hospital, the Exercise for Health Center, where we worked with the cardiac rehabilitation team. And we were able to then develop exercise referral programs and work with many of these other hospitals um, uh, in, in the region. So out of all of that, 1999 came along and it was a key year for me. Does anybody want to take a break? No, you're all right? Okay. Um, First of all, it was my, uh, my dear mother passed away after about seven years of Alzheimer's uh, in that year. But um, Gareth, who's here, where's Gareth? Gareth, Gareth, there's at the back there. Jane Holmes, our lecturer from Kiel, and myself, we wrote this textbook, Exercise on Prescription, and we're still using it for the students now. Still has some good relevance. Um, I got my first published paper on cardiac rehabilitation. Um, I started a PhD. The BACR took me on as a tutor for, for cardiac rehabilitation, and the National Neuromuscular Myocardial Disease Clinic was starting up in Oslo Street. So lots of things happening, but you can see that all of these things nicely fed into um, chapters for a PhD. So the PhD came together with these various elements of cardiac rehabilitation, neuromuscular disease, um, and, uh, and, and the ratings of perceived exertion. So one of the groundbreaking things that was going on at the hospital in Stoke, and this is published in 1999, was talking about getting patients to exercise within less than two weeks after having a heart attack. And it took till 2011 before we started actually recommending that in fact, when a patient has a heart attack, if they're stable, we need to get them exercising as soon as possible. But this clever team led by uh, Dr. Um, John Davis, um, uh, um, a, a very open-minded cardiologist in terms of um, getting to do different and new things, um, said, well, let's do a trial and let's look at evaluating, getting people going on um, in early rehabilitation. So that same year, I'm, I was taken on as a tutor by the BACR, and um, Dr. Jenny Bell, who had started up the education program, um, had seen some of my work in my textbook, and met various people. Now these four people in yellow are all here tonight. So Sally, Vivian, Professor David Wood, and Jennifer Jones, they're all here tonight. So thank you very much for coming uh, and, and being part of this. Um, my life was never has never been the same since BACPR. So you've got lifestyle fitness, we got BACPR, and we got physiotherapists. So they, they're the people that have sort of kept me going for a long time. A nice surprise in 2011, we found that our little textbook that we'd written for physiotherapy students at Kiel found its way as a, as a reference and used within the National uh, Exercise Referral Quality Assurance Framework. Um, and so then once that's in something like that, you start to get people getting interested in what you're doing. Now this chap here is Gunnar Borg. He's not from Star Trek, but he invented the Borg scale. And it is the most widely used scale in exercise in the world and he's probably cited more than any other person, and he came to a little conference we had um, on using his scale in Bangor, where a number of us met. And I was doing some work on using this rating scale to exercise guys with um, blind people, uh, with neuromuscular disease pain, and heart patients. So, in terms of here, this is England's blind soccer team, and we've got a braille, scale to rate how hard they're finding the exercise and measuring how much oxygen um, there. So that was a really interesting study uh, that we did. Um, that same year, I have to pay tribute to Dr. Ros Quinn Liven, who's a, a neuromuscular uh, specialist and a pediatrician. And she was at Oswestry, but she's now more recently moved to UCL in London. And she got me involved with the McArdles Clinic because she was actually working at the Shrewsbury Hospital and simply came down to join the gym. And we started talking about these McArdles patients that she started to treat and, and start to run them up. And out of that, then I was very, very fortunate to be part of teams where we very published in, in, in fairly high impact journals, the Cochrane Review, which is a, a lead review, um, the British Journal of Sports Medicine with my sports science mates, um, Richard Godfrey and Greg White. 
and then obviously this study which was done part of my, my, um, my PhD. So I've been able to touch base with lots of really influential people and really, um, you know, this, this game, this academic game, game is often um, about who you meet and when you meet them um, and luck and opportunity as much as the hard work. Um, so some of the clinical features of these patients. How many people have ever had severe muscle pain? Severe muscle pain. Well, these people live with that amount of pain most days of the week. Um, very rarely do you have that on a regular basis. But they get uh, muscle cramps and pain and contractures in their muscles, and it often occurs within the first 15 seconds up to six minutes of more vigorous activity. So if you're picking up something or you're run, rushing for something, um, the muscles aren't working properly because they, they're missing one of the key energy systems. And we know that um, one of the reasons they have this is they don't have the system that produces lactic acid or, or blood lactate. So that's one of the tests that we use. Now they get severe, severe muscle pain, so the best way to manage their activity is really about how they learn to perceive that pain and whether the pain is at a right level or if it's not at a good level. Um, and some of the measures that are taken are creatine kinase, which is an enzyme which comes under the muscle if you damage the muscle. And even worse, this thing called myoglobin. Now that the hemoglobin is in the blood, the myoglobin holds the oxygen in the muscle. And if you damage your muscle badly enough, this leaks itself into the blood and blocks the kidneys. So most patients who get this diagnosed with myocardial disease, half of them have been di diagnosed because they wound up in ITU um, um, needing um, dialysis to clear their kidneys. Um, and um, often CK in the past has been used as a marker of da muscle damage to the heart for heart attacks. But normal values, so most of you, this is your score, don't worry what the score means, is 400. And you'd have to run a marathon or you'd have to do some really heavy lifting in order to increase that value by even 100 points. And you wouldn't really notice much difference except a bit of ache or pain the next few days. Where these patients have a resting value four times that, and within 10 minutes of exercise, that can change. So 10 minutes of exercise for their muscles is like most of you having run a marathon. So we measured their pain and looked at their walking speed, and it seemed to coincide that they're their walking speed slows down and it goes up as in relation to the pain. But more interesting, their heart rate would go up with the pain. Now most of you, if you did exercise, your heart rate follows your walking speed. So if your walking speed slows down, normally your heart. So what the heart rate is doing, it's measuring the pain and not your exertion. And so we've, we, when we looked at the point where your heart rate starts to come down and the pain starts, so we, we teach them how to manage their pain by wearing heart rate monitors and using pain scales. So, I was able to then go on and work with Gunnar Borg and we published a paper on strength training and we actually got to do the study um, at Lifestyle Fitness with some of our um, clients. So Chester, we're almost there. We're in Chester. We're almost at Shrewsbury. Those of you who want to sit down, you can. Oh, I'm almost to time. So I'd like to pay tribute, first of all, to Kevin Sykes. Kevin, are you, are you, where has Kevin gone? I saw him you there. You're still there. So Kevin Sykes was um, um, not, a, not, a, not a popular person at Keele University um, and because he was running a master's degree in cardiovascular health and rehabilitation, and it seemed to fit with the areas that I was working with, and that got quite exciting. And the dean of the time, Professor Sarah Andrew, was very good um, um, in supporting that, and I got to work with um, some, some vascular surgeons. That was very attractive, and obviously, uh, th those are in yellow are here. So next to Kevin is Dr. John Summeru, Professor John Summeru now, who's a sports cardiologist and cardiologist at Chester. Some of the other people at Chester, Mike Morris, who's a good friend of mine, but um, we've done lots of de program, um, research designs together. And this chap, Ajish Contractor, he's based at the Asian Heart Institute, and we, um, I was through Kevin's work with Ajish, I was very, very fortunate to be able to go to Mumbai on a regular basis to do some teaching there. And you can see Paul Edwards and myself obviously working very hard um, um, in Mumbai. But these were this is our, these are the students at the Asian Heart Institute. Now, Ajish um, actually has another role to play in a few slides down the, down the, down the way. Um, during the time that I'd moved to 
Chester. I was fortunate enough to, to work with the British Association of Sport and Exercise Sciences, and they commissioned a textbook um, on physiology, and they were preparing a, a group of textbooks. And David here wrote one of the chapters on obesity and diabetes in that textbook, and the physiology guidelines for testing um, clinical populations as opposed to athletes. Mike Morse, who I mentioned earlier, um, um, I was, became part of his PhD supervisory team, and Mike published some, some good papers um, it, on perceiving exertion and estimating people's exercise capacity. But the best one that uh, Mike and I shared in terms of supervising with this paper on the physiological responses of energy expenditure of the Connect Active Video Game, that's the Xbox Connect. And it found, um, it, was, it, it, was, it wasn't a big study, but in terms of um, notoriety, it got into Time magazine. Um, so thanks to Mike. Mike was, Mike was obviously very, he's always innovative and, and very um, broad-minded thinking. So again, another person who's come along who's really helped um, help with the design of things. Now, uh, moved on to another PhD student, which is Dr. Ros Leslie. Ros is there. And there she's in her kit and just graduated. And she's published a couple of papers. Um, and she's a, the therapy services manager at Wolverhampton but she was doing exercise with her heart failure patients in Wolverhampton, and we've done quite a bit of work together. So what we found in many of these studies was how people used oxygen during exercise. And it wasn't just about fitness. It was about the economy. And that's very apropos for tomorrow again. Um, and what we found is if you have heart problems, you seem, unfortunately, to use more oxygen to do exercise than a healthy person. We're not quite sure why that is, but unfortunately, if you have heart problems or circulatory problems, here's a walking test. The line in the, the blue is how much oxygen people are using at different walking speeds of a walking test. And the red is the normal healthy people of the same age. Um, why that is, it's, it's not quite known. But one of the things is it's not just about getting people more fit. It's about getting more bang for your buck. Getting people to exercise properly may improve their ability to use oxygen and they become more economical. Um, so we don't always look for fitness changes. Now, if you look at these East African middle distance runners and you compare them to Europeans, they use 12% less oxygen to run at the same speed. So if the, um, one of the reasons why the East Africans are so good at endurance is actually they save oxygen. They use less oxygen. So can you train people to use less oxygen? We've got, always got two options. Try and get people to use more oxygen, uh, uh, have bigger capacities, or be more economical. So we measured that. This is Greg White. This is Rebecca Romero, uh, Olympic gold medalist at the Cardiovascular Society Conference. And we were using the same measurements in the heart failure patients and the cardiac patients as used for the athletes. And so we've just used simple um, walking tests, and we're looking at their heart rates. So this is part of Ros's PhD. Um, she's probably working on writing it up for publication soon. Um, but she's busy running the hospital in Wolverhampton, probably. So that's probably getting in the way. Um, but she found with her patients, they didn't really walk any further after eight weeks of exercise training with her. And the patients said, well, that's no good. I didn't improve. But when you looked at their heart rates, the red line is that they were using less heart work and probably less oxygen to do the same amount of activity. And that was probably just as good an improvement in their fitness as it was their performance. So yes, exercise training improves your economy. And you're probably wondering why there's ballroom dancing in there. Now, this study used ballroom dancing in heart failure patients as the training intervention. And what they did is they measured these patients' economy, and they improved their exercise capacity by 5 to 10%, but they used 20 to 30% less oxygen to do their ballroom dancing eight weeks down the road compared to when they first started. So again, this whole idea of getting people active and showing them how to be active in a more economical way may be just advantageous to them as is trying to improve their fitness. So, Comparing heart failure patients with Olympic athletes. This is the British Cardiovascular Society Conference. Well, these guys, uh, Sanjay Sharma and Greg White said, hey, let's do a test in front of 200 cardiologists. And this guy's got heart failure. And this is um, 
Alex Triggs Hodge, who's an Olympic gold medalist rower, and let's put them head to head in an exercise test. Well, we constructed the exercise test so they would both finish sim at similar times. So we're able to construct that and compare those. So I'm grateful to this group um, for the opportunity to work um, across using these things. Now, I put this thing here, Cran Lee equipment. Where's Cran Lee? There's Andy there. Now, I met the guys at Cranley in 1988 when we set up Lifestyle Fitness um, to get our exercise testing equipment there. And for ever since then, um, and every time we ran one of these events, they always provided us with the ECG and the respiratory equipment to do our tests. So, um, and, and they have equipped our lab upstairs, as some of you have seen. So this group of cardiology, uh, sports cardiologist specialists all got together and, and they were um, they were putting together this new manual for sports cardiology for the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, and they said we should have a chapter on physical activity and rehabilitation. So I was um, obviously in the bar at the right time um, when they were discussing this. And you know, you, you make a joke about that, but sometimes, again, that is what happens is that um, if people know about you and you're doing your work and you're in the bar at the right time, these, these opportunities. So again, this it seems reasonably, um, again, another one of those lucky gains. And this will be out sometime um, over the summer or in November, up to November. So finally, um, these people here at the BACPR, a huge uh, amount of time has been spent with these amazing, motivated, intelligent group of people. And I've been very fortunate to be part of developing the new standards and guidelines for this, um, but many of the people are in this room that have contributed to these guidelines. Jenny's here, Sally's here, Professor Wood is here, who led on the Joint British Society guidelines for which cardiac rehabilitation um, features in those. But what we did said was that the most important element of any of these guidelines is about people. And the biggest challenge to us is educating people and changing their behavior. Um, in and amongst giving them the medications and exercise and smoking, uh, cessation and nutrition and, and psychological advice, the biggest challenge to all of these things is actually getting people to understand why they've got heart disease and how they can change their lifestyle. So finally, you'll see this. Here's Ajish again popping up from when I met him in India. And after being president of the BACPR, um, with, I went to Canada for a couple of months and met this chap, Darren Warburton, in Vancouver, and we just started chatting about collaborating between the Canadian Association for Cardiac Rehab and the British. And what ended up happening is that he's, uh, they brought in another person, this name, lady named Dr. Sherry Grace from Toronto, and they'd been collaborating. And they said, well, they'd just done an international charter for physical activity. Why don't we have one for cardiac rehabilitation? So we started working, and, and the Americans came on board. So we created the International Council for Cardiovascular Prevention and Rehabilitation. I think we have about 1,000 US dollars in the bank account as our thing. So it's, it's, it seems very grand, but it's just a group of volunteers getting together from around the world. But we um, have come together under the World Heart Federation as one of their groups. Um, and now we've created a club of 27 associations from around the globe um, in the last four years. Um, as part of the World Heart Federation. So a couple of weeks ago, we met for a meeting in Mexico at the um, World Congress of Cardiology and Cardiovascular Health. And um, this is our, our team here. And because I was the, the chair, I was um, allowed to be the signatory of the New Mexico Declaration for Cardiovascular Circulatory Health, which is being promoted by the World Health Organization. So another, another lucky uh, another lucky situation that I found myself in, um, in terms of all these amazing people. And these are some amazing people from around, um, around the world and what they're doing um, to improve people's health. So remember this, don't forget this. 97%, now you've stood for half an hour. Okay, that's an extra half a calorie a minute compared to those of you who are sitting. Okay. So you think that 15 or 20 calories extra compared to the people sitting down isn't much, but add it up over the day, over the year, and remember that eight pounds of fat that you'd like to lose on the 1st of January. Okay, so 
these two chaps have a healthy commute. They both exercise 30 minutes of moderate intensity per day. But they both have two unhealthy habits that go in conjunction with this guy smoking and this guy is sitting. And they're losing much of the benefit of this activity because of the other activity. And this Canadian study has shown that people who stand at work on their feet all day, they only have a 4% premature mortality rate, whereas people who sit all day at work have four times the greater uh, risk of dying prematurely from cardiovascular disease and other diseases compared to the people who are on their feet all day. And that's just changing the way people uh, work. And this is quite a large study following people for many years um, looking at their work patterns. So this is my bank in Canada, the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, where the tellers all stand up. This is my bank in Shrewsbury, or I'm at Lloyd's Bank in Shrewsbury, and all the people are sitting down. If you go into a Sainsbury's equivalent or a Safeway in Canada, the checkout people are all standing up. If you go into a Tesco's or Sainsbury's or whatever, they all have a seat. And why is that? And these people do four, five, six hour shifts. And so is it that difficult maybe to just add a little bit of activity in people's daily lives that over the course of weeks and days and years could actually pile up to be something significant? So that's why um, one of the reasons why I've taken interest in this, and there are about nine studies that have looked at standing up at work for which one of ours uh, we've done. And I'd like to recognize Frank Joseph, who's a diabetes consultant at um, Chester, who helped us with designing the study. Is again, Mike's, Mike's name there, and another nutritionist, uh, Dwayne Meller from Chester. Um, so as part of this, we got to meet and work with uh, Michael Mosley and his team and uh, design this study in this real estate agents in um, Chester. Now, we also got our own cartoon in the Daily Mail. Um, could working standing up help you lose weight? And here's this truck driver standing up. So that was, that was and one of our colleagues from uh, Melbourne who's done lots of research, he says, I never get any cartoons. He said, I never get on the television. He says, I have to work really, really hard and you just get on the television. Um, so, and, and so these, these things do have an impact. But I have to say that the, the media and communications people at the University of Chester are really good at um, getting contacts to tell people about the work people are doing. So we've shown that um, people who sit, this is their after lunch, this is their glucose levels in the yellow, and if you stand, your glucose levels are significantly lower. So on a repeated basis, the idea might be that maybe sitting a lot and building up glucose in your bloodstream might be one of the reasons why people develop diabetes as a result of spending all day sitting doing nothing. So overall, in looking at those nine studies, it looks like you need to be on your feet at least seven to 10 minutes every hour and a total of two hours per day. There are some pitfalls to this, and one of them we found um, was one of our PhD students at the moment, Lizzie, who's, who's been doing a study at Virgin Media Call Center, and this is a different breed, because most of these studies you look at in sport and exercise science are, are done on people of a certain socioeconomic status uh, re reasonably motivated, where if you go into a call center, it is a different type of person. And so we, we measured the same things as we did in the estate agents and measured their blood glucose levels um, after lunch and after doing activity, and we got no change. And poor Lizzie said to me, this is awful. She said, your research has shown that this and this. And I said, this is really, really good news. And, and, and she said, why? I said, because we need to find out why you think that their blood glucose didn't change by giving them a sit-stand desk. And she's thought about it and thought about it. And in the Virgin Media call center, they have a thing called an angel. An angel, because when you're a call center worker, you have to be tied to your desk, taking as many calls as possible. There's these angels that roam around the call center saying, can I get you a cappuccino? Can I go to the loo for you? Um, <laughs> would you? Would you like something? And the angels have a trolley, like on Virgin Airlines, and the trolley is full of sugary foods. And we figure the fact is that it didn't have an effect is because they were consuming a lot of sugary food. So again, it now goes back to saying that perhaps the nutrition element when we're doing light activity and the intensity isn't that great, 
we do also have to add in the importance of nutrition. And so just having a sit-stand desk, if you have a terrible diet, um, won't have the effects that we suggest. So standing work um, may also lead people to do less activity outside of work. And David's colleagues at Loughborough University have looked at this and they got people to do standing based work. And what they found is they're a little less active. They thought, oh, I've been active all day. I've been on my feet all day, been at my desk, and therefore I can put my feet up at home and do little less activity. But the total activity by giving them the desk was still greater than those who didn't have a desk at all. So there was some benefit. But there is a trade-off that people's behaviors thinking that if they get one of these things. So as part of an international group, I was very, uh, very lucky again to be involved with this group and we came up with these recommendations. So what we said is for desk-based workers, you need to accumulate two hours of being on your feet per day, ideally a total of four hours. Even if you do your 150 minutes a week, um, if you sit too much, you lose much of the benefit from your exercise. So going back to Darwin, this is where we've evolved to people sitting down at their desks. So we now have to reverse this pattern of people. And this is reverse, this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four. Now, if you follow the chief medical officer's report for physical activity, what she is asking you to do if you're a person who sits most of the time is go from reverse into third gear. Now, most of you try and drive your car from reverse into third gear, you will stall. And that's what happens to people's behavior. So really, we need to change people's behavior maybe by doing, getting them at least on their feet, doing a bit more, maybe considering being more movement in their activity daily life, and think of this behavioral continuum. Rather than trying to throw this concept of exercise at people from um, a non-starting position. So we're finally there. Time to close out this final set. It's a five-shot rally. I've got three philosopher's quotes and two thank yous. So, these are the three philosophers. Does anybody know who they are? Pardon? Ernest. That's Ernest Hemingway, correct. Who are the other two philosophers? Okay, well the first philosopher is Dr. Seuss. <laughs> and he's very good about human behavior because he said you're in pretty good shape for the shape you're in. Here he's doing an exercise test. And he's relativizing the um, exercise motivation to the individual person. So taking them and giving them and fine. It doesn't matter where you're starting from. It doesn't matter how unfit or on how unwell you are. That's the way you are and we'll go from there. The second philosopher is Charles Schultz. And his, <laughs> here we got Snoopy, jogging should be done regularly. If you haven't jogged for a while, you should start off slow. That's slow enough. And therefore, if you look at what the chief medical officer is now saying in her new um, outputs, she's saying something is better than nothing. Start small and build up gradually, just 10 minutes at a time to, that provides a benefit. Make a start today. It's never too late. So again, um, we, we always have these other philosophers that are always well ahead of the curve of the scientists. Finally, Ernest Hemingway, writing and travel broaden your ass, if not your mind, and I like to write standing up. Most of his books he wrote from that desk of him standing up. So just a, a thank you for all of you coming tonight, but a special thank you to all those people that are involved with these organizations here. There's the family there. Um, and the second thank you really is to <coughs> Professor Tim Wheeler um, and Professor Anna Sutton and the Shropshire people and their council for giving a number of us here at the University Center Shrewsbury the opportunity to do something exciting. So here I am in, the, in, the, in this um, grouping of medicine and health and biosciences, but I'm a little dot in there. We have people um, who are all keen to develop this institution and brand new programs from absolute scratch in, in all of these programs. And, and without the, um, the support and the vision of those three groups, the vice chancellor's team, Anna and uh, Shropshire people, um, none of us would be sitting here at the moment. So thank you very much. Okay. Maybe if you want, I don't know. I'd like to invite you to sit down for a minute, if that's all right.
I had no idea how long it was going to be, sorry. That's all right. I'd I'd also uh, like to know how long I need to stand up for to deal with the cake. (laughs) Well, at least it's better than having to sit down for a minute. So enjoy the cake. Because you know some parts of it have gone already. Yeah, good. good. It makes me feel slightly better. Has anybody got any questions for John? (laughs) There's some pepper. I didn't catch that. Can you say it again? <laughs> <laughs> There's one at the back. I had a question early uh, in, in the presentation. I think it was the second set. You talked about why people did physical exercise and you stated a sort of a genetic proclivity. Do you think that it is a genetic belief thing? Or do you think that you tend to respond to the environment? If your parents do sport, you'll do sport. It's just how you yeah. live. Can, you, can a child from non-sporty, non-active parents be sporty? Um, the answer to that is obviously yes, but um, it's always a combination in genetics environment and we know that if people are reasonably skilled and can do things well, they will enjoy them and they will probably continue on with them if they have a social environment that supports that. So you need the social, because you, you may have lots of kids that are quite talented athletes, but their parents are never seen at their football matches, their parents aren't taking them anywhere or supporting them and there's no playtime in the family. So, that, so that, that genetic predisposition to being skilled isn't. And it, it isn't being supported. Or the other way around is that many kids, by the age of 10 or 11, they work out, actually, I'm not very good at doing sport. But they also do it with everything else. I'm not very good at maths, or I'm not very good at art, or I'm not very good at music. So that curve probably happens for all things in life, not just sport. So what we have to do is construct physical activity in a way that can keep people enjoying it. And this push just for sport, I'm not against sport, I love sport, and I think it's a great entertainment, it's a great social thing, as many of us know. But for, for 80% of the population, we have to construct activity in another way for them. Yeah. And we've lost that spontaneous children's play, I think, a lot, because it's been replaced by other things. Yeah. Yes, their thumbs get a lot of activity. <laughs> yeah. Good question, though. Have we got another one? I just want to know, um, before when you were talking about um, a little bit of activity and doing the statistics for the children with PE and things like this, I work with kids with your disability and there's been tons and tons of um, stats going into the, the lack of activity and the lack of inclusion and stuff. I just want to know whether you've seen anything in your sort of like professional and, 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 and personal experience so far with all the research, whether, whether anything's sort of improving in that way, um, or, or it, is the focus, it, do, you, do you think the focus needs to be on that a little bit more now to, 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 to bring more children with, with disabilities into physical activity? The answer to that is definitely yes. My area hasn't hasn't really de- dealt with children a lot. I sort of seem to wait until people become ill before I help them, which is a, maybe I should change my ways as well. But you're, you're exactly right. But we have, for anybody, we need to construct activity, and whether it's by rebuilding the environment, getting people to transport themselves using their muscles rather than machines, um, um, and, and, and how we... Children are at school all day long. They don't need to do sport all the time to get their activity. If you give kids something to do in spare time and they don't have anything else to do, they'll probably be on their feet and running around and playing. I think we've taken that. So with children who are disabled, we have to (coughs) find ways to to make them that. But, you know, that's only my thoughts on that. I haven't got a great deal of experience on on that point. Thank you. I think uh, as time is moving on a little, um, I would now like to uh, invite someone who has already been mentioned um, in John's presentation this evening, and that is Professor David Wood from Imperial College London, who is the President-elect of the World Heart Foundation. To give a vote of thanks, please. Thank you very much. It, um, I was really, really delighted to receive the invitation Um, uh, to give uh, this uh, vote of thanks. Um, It's a privilege uh, to be here, John, and it has been a tour de force, a really outstanding um, inaugural lecture, and what a wonderful uh, start 
to your new academic role uh, as Professor of Applied Exercise Science. Um, I, I have got to know John through his progressively more important leadership uh, roles. Um, he, he, he was a founder uh, of the British Association of Cardiac Rehabilitation Exercise Professionals Group. Um, and um, he did so very sensibly with two, two very powerful women. Um, Annie Holden, who is an exercise specialist like, like John, and uh, Dr. Jennifer uh, Jones, who is a, 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 a physiotherapist. And that was the start of his progression through this professional association until he achieved uh, the leadership position of president uh, of BACR. Uh, in 2009 and walked into what was a maelstrom uh, of debate over the name of the association. And the debate was around whether or not to include the word prevention in the title of the association, the British Association of Cardiac Rehabilitation or the British Association of Cardiac Prevention and Rehabilitation. And for those of you who are not familiar with this area of medicine, uh, let me illustrate uh, the dilemma that John faced. Because if you look at the European textbook of cardiovascular medicine, you will see two distinct chapters. One on exercise, rehabilitation, and one on prevention. And the exercise rehabilitation chapter speaks for itself. The one on prevention addresses smoking cessation, uh, nutrition, uh, 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 weight uh, management, control of blood pressure and cholesterol and diabetes, taking cardioprotective medications and so on. And so you might be forgiven for asking the question, well, aren't these two sides of the same coin? Is this not just one coin? And the patient uh, who's had a heart attack or cardiac surgery requires both exercise rehabilitation and also prevention and therefore the two should be together in the title of the association. Well, it was through John's leadership uh, and his uh, board that he brought the association to a vote and the vote was in favour after a very um, uh, spirited debate, uh, the vote was in favour of a name change to cardiovascular prevention and rehabilitation. And I congratulate John for embracing the vision of prevention and rehabilitation uh, being together in the title of the association of which he was a president. president. And his, um, his leadership role is not just at a national level, as you heard, um, he was one of the founders of the International Council uh, of Cardiac Rehabilitation. Actually, he had a moment of regression here. He called me to say, we are creating an International Council of Cardiac Rehabilitation. I said, wait, wait, wait a moment, John. What happened to prevention? And I'm very glad to say that it became the International Council of Cardiovascular Prevention and Rehabilitation and now enjoys the patronage of 26, by my count, but 27, you said this evening, national organizations that represent uh, this very important uh, specialty. And so uh, John's uh, leadership, uh, and you have seen uh, several examples of that in his, in his lecture uh, this evening, has been very important in moving the professional agenda forward uh, for uh, our uh, discipline. Now, as you know, we are disciples of yours, and uh, at the start of this summer, uh, my wife Katrina and I uh, rejoined the gym uh, in our Get Fit Summer campaign. Uh, we played um, a game of um, uh, racquetball. Uh, well, we were warming up uh, in the, in, uh, for this game and my wife fell very badly and, and, and broke her arm. 
Anyway, I called her father and said, uh, your daughter has broken her arm. He said, give her 24 hours, she will be blaming you. <laughs> but it actually took just over half an hour before I was, I was in the dock. So it, this was an unfortunate start to our Get Fit Summer campaign. But as soon as she is mended, we will be on the racket ball court and again. And one of the things that I've learned from this experience was I've spent uh, all of our married life undressing her. But in the last <laughs> few weeks, I've learned to dress her. <laughs> A new skill acquired. Um, John, you, in your uh, new role, um, have uh, so much uh, to give. This is not a festive tonight. It is an inaugural uh, lecture. You are young, well, relatively speaking, <laughs> um, and you still have an enormous contribution uh, to give intellectually in your new uh, academic role as a teacher of the new uh, generation, and of course with your continuing roles and responsibilities as a leader um, of our, our discipline. I wish you every success in your new academic role, and thank you for this wonderful lecture this evening. very much to your credit to see so many of your colleagues, past and present, here this evening. Thank you very much for a superb first inaugural lecture at the University Centre Shrewsbury. And can I thank everybody most sincerely for taking the time to come this evening. And would you like to join us, please, through that door uh, for a drink and some refreshments? You're most welcome. Thank you.